What's up guys, my name is Serge and today I'm going to take you through the computer PC build process. Alright, so a few reasons why you should listen to me. I have a computer science background and I've been building computers since I was 12 years old. I also cover three different price ranges. First price range is how to make a $1,000 gaming computer or workstation and we'll kind of discuss the differences between those two. A $400 or $300 home gaming computer and then I'll also cover how to make a $300 media center PC. I'll show you in-depth instructions without technical jargon so you can understand what it's actually like to build a PC. I'll go over each part in fairly simple terms and pretty good detail and then we're going to assemble the PC together. The other reason why you should take a look at this video is that it is optimized for mobile. Meaning if you're watching from a phone or a tablet, you'll be able to use this as you're building your own computer. Now, why would you go out and make a PC? Well, for one, you can save anywhere from 40 to 60% on cost alone, and you can create a system specifically tailored to your needs. So what like the manufacturers do like HP and Dell, it may not exactly be what you want out of a computer. I'll show you how to make the exact computer that you want. The other thing that you'll get from this video that you won't find anywhere else is a person to actually talk to. I will be replying to all comments. That's one promise that most YouTubers can't make. The other thing that makes this video unique is that I cover a vast majority of different types of builds. We have builds that are as small that can fit into the palm of my hand. And we have everything in between. For instance, take a look at this right here. This system here will be an APU system. It has a GPU and a CPU in one. We have various different case sizes from medium to small cube-like, full tower, just a tiny bit smaller than normal, and then even bigger than that. We have high-end graphics cards, high-end processors, mid-range processors, and even processors that have video cards built into them. So let's take a look at what kind of parts we're gonna be working with today. The only thing you'll need is a Phillips screwdriver. However, I use a power tool to expedite the process. So let's take a look at the system that we're gonna be building today. Here's what the system looks like when it's fully built. The only difference here is that the cords are disorganized. Now you see them organized. Throughout our build process, I'm gonna introduce you to small little tips that can help you save tons of time. Cord management is gonna be pretty essential if you don't organize the cords, it's going to be really hard to get in there and upgrade the parts in the future. And overall, it's just really good for airflow. Take a look at this little Velcro strap that you can cut off from the spool and then just kind of wrap it around your wires. It's a pretty impressive system. Let's go take a look at our case. All right, here we have our power cord. Unwrap that. Our case comes with a bunch of screws. But hold off. Don't use these screws quite yet. And hold on to that speaker because we'll plug it in later on. These screws are mostly for either the motherboard or installing drives into your computer. Drives would be like CD-ROM drives or like hard drives. We're going to plug in the speaker into our motherboard when we get a chance here. Familiarize yourself with the cords that come with this power supply. So what we have here is the 24 pin power connector. This connector here supplies most of the power to your motherboard. The other connectors you see here on the right are Molex, and then on the left is a SATA connector. The SATA connector is a newer type of standard. However, both standards are included in most power supplies, so you shouldn't have to worry about having one or the other. Here's our four pin motherboard connector. That one will also be for powering the motherboard. Then we have our front header connectors like our USB, our audio, our power switch, reset switch, and hard drive and power LEDs. Hard drive and power LEDs are just little lights that flash when you're, that tell you when the computer's on. The power switch and reset switch are just buttons that you click on the case to either turn the case on or reset it. The HD audio is for things like sound, and the USB is for our universal serial bus connectors. Let's have a look inside our case. So since we have a smaller ITX motherboard, we're going to have only four holes to work with here. Some motherboards will be a lot larger than the one that we've used, and they'll utilize the outer holes that you see there on the side. Our case came with a 380 watt power supply. This should be pretty good for our build, as our build is only realistically going to require around 300 watts or less. On the sides there, you see the back panels where your video card will connect to. You also see your IO shield area 
where your inputs and outputs from your motherboard will be. Over here you see our drives area. At the bottom you can connect smaller drives, at the top you can connect bigger drives. The bigger drives area really isn't used as often anymore. However, the area below it is used more frequently for things like your solid state drive or your hard drive disk. Now we'll look at our first motherboard here. So this is an ITX Gigabyte motherboard. I chose the ITX form factor because it's small. ITX is a type of class of motherboards that are much smaller than the ones that we're used to seeing. I really like this one because I feel like it has a good selection of ports. We have our old mouse and keyboard ports, USB, Wi-Fi, DVI, two HDMIs, Ethernet, USB-C, two extra USBs, and then our audio connectors. I feel like this motherboard gives you a lot of value for its price. In the center, we have our CPU socket. This one here is the Intel CPU socket. The pins are on the motherboard and they're gonna connect with the CPU. Here's what our motherboard looks like from the top down view. To the right, you see those two big slots. Those are gonna be where we're gonna insert our RAM. Those are our RAM slots. At the bottom, we have our PCI Express slot. This is where the video card will connect. This will allow you to do things like gaming, watching videos and movies. It's the slot that's specifically designed for video cards or other peripherals that require a lot of speed. On the right there, you're gonna see more power connectors and in the middle right there, you see our front headers. That will be for like our power switch. At the top, we have more power connectors and more headers. We also have a main USB header. Not all cases will support that. Came included with our motherboard is the IO shield. This is our inputs and outputs shield that we're gonna connect into our case. Our motherboard is gonna connect to it as well. I'll show you how that works in a second. But first, let's have a look at our CPU. I chose the G44 Intel because it was fairly fast for around 50 bucks and there's really nothing faster for that price range. It can run all your games on high and you could even do productivity related tasks like 3D rendering, video editing, and even music production. It's a pretty powerful little CPU. Let's have a look at it. So the CPU is probably the most complex and tends to be the more expensive thing in our build. However, in this build, since it's a budget build, it's only really 50 bucks. Here's our CPU manual. It's got some instructions on how to install the CPU. However, you probably won't be needing this as I'll be showing you how to install the CPU. I'll be showing you how to install this one here, this Intel one, and also an AMD one. So looking around on the motherboard, there is quite a bit going on with it, but once you start breaking it down, it really becomes a lot more simple. It makes a lot of sense. If you guys have any questions, definitely leave a comment down below because I will be replying to all comments. On the bottom left there, we have a M2 connection for really, really fast hard drives called SSD drives that, are, that support NVMe. Those drives are extremely fast. Let's go ahead and install our CPU. Every motherboard is gonna have a type of cage that's around the CPU socket. You're gonna wanna lift that up. Let's take a look at our CPU. There's gonna be a notch on the far right and a notch on the far left. You're gonna to wanna to line these notches up before you install the CPU into the motherboard. To install the CPU, you just kinda of wanna line the notches up and just plop the CPU in there. You really don't need to do much more. Once it falls in place, you'll just verify that it's lined up with the little triangle there at the bottom left. And if the triangles match, then that means you have a good to go. So start putting the cage back on, and then lift the door back up and make sure the cage is properly aligned and under that screw at the very bottom you see there. And slowly start moving the little lever down and that'll secure your CPU. It's really not that uncommon to hear uh, weird crunching sounds and you're gonna feel a pretty good amount of resistance when you're bringing down that lever. So don't worry, bring down the lever and secure it. Here we have our CPU heatsink. This little item here is responsible for keeping our CPU cool. So lots of data and information and electricity flows through the CPU. Since it does do most of the work, it does need to be cooled. We have some thermal paste that we're gonna put on top of our CPU. This is gonna allow our CPU to cool a little bit better. Some heat sinks come with thermal paste already. However, I do like to add more to make sure my device is a little bit cooler. Plus, previously I had removed my heatsink, so the thermal paste had to be removed. Anytime you remove a heatsink, you're gonna to wanna to add more thermal paste. The Intel heatsinks are very easy to put on. Line them up with the four holes on the motherboard, and then simply push the heatsink onto the CPU. It's very, very easy and simple. 
then once you're certain you've done that, you wanna lift the motherboard up by the CPU. Let's take a look at our RAM. So RAM is responsible for loading information uh, from the hard drive and storing it there temporarily while you work on it. Let's go ahead and get it installed. So RAM has little notches, a little notch sort of in the center of the stick. If you're attempting to install it and the notches don't match, most likely you're about to install the RAM incorrectly and you risk breaking the RAM or the motherboard. Make sure the notches line up, insert it and push in at the very top and bottom like so. Have a look from this different angle here. It kind of shows a much better picture of how to install the RAM. The RAM can sometimes get stuck, so you may need to pull that out and then reposition it and then push it in again. Most of the time, the little arms that snap into place, like you see that at the bottom right, they'll snap in on their own once you've pushed the RAM deep enough. You don't, usually don't even need to use your hands to snap them in on their own. So we have our CPU and our RAM installed. Now it's time to insert this into our motherboard. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at the IO shield and get that installed. So the IO shield basically makes sure that when you're plugging in peripherals into the back of the motherboard, that you don't accidentally put them through a weird hole where they don't belong. So let's go ahead and get this installed. So bring the shield in from within the case and push very hard. Some IO shields just are extremely hard to install. So make sure you apply ample pressure while trying to install them. I had to push quite hard. I must have applied anywhere from 20 pounds, maybe 25 pounds of force on each corner to install the IO shield. Sometimes they're just really difficult to install. Let's go ahead and pick up our motherboard again by the CPU and then insert it. Once you insert it, the IO shield is gonna be pushing back at the motherboard. In other words, your motherboard's screw holes are not gonna be properly aligned. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that those screw holes are aligned with the holes in the case or else you won't be able to screw the motherboard in properly. Right now, I'm pushing the motherboard towards the IO shield. See how if I release pressure, it just goes back to not being aligned, you're gonna to have to continuously push on the motherboard towards the IO shield until you can get a screw in there. Let's go ahead and get our first screw in there. But before we do, we're gonna make sure all four holes are properly lined up with the holes in the case. And it looks like they are. So let's go ahead and get that installed. The screws that came with my motherboard are the ones that you're going to want to use. Try to avoid using the ones that go with the case because they're not always going to work with the motherboard. Sometimes you may need to use a combination of screws if you don't have the right ones. We're going to probably use the one on the far right there or the one in the middle. The one on the far left is usually used for screwing in drives like hard drives, CD-ROM drives. We're probably not even gonna potentially use that one. It really depends on how big the screw holes are. Check to see if these screw in. If there's way too much resistance and the screw gets stuck, don't use it because you're not gonna be able to fully screw the screw in anyway. I use a power tool so I can speed up the whole screwing in process, but you can use any you know Phillips screwdriver or any screwdriver you have laying around that could work. Some people even have used knives before. When I was making my first build, I didn't even have a screwdriver. I just used a knife to install it. It was pretty hilarious. Don't recommend you do that, but if you don't have the right tools, you may need to improvise. Once you've got the screws installed, just verify that everything's properly in there. I always do opposing screw sides. I'll do one at the bottom right and then I'll do one at the top left and then I can screw the other screws in later once I've completed and verified that the build works. The reason I don't do the other screws is because, well, why should I? If there's a problem, I'm gonna need to probably remove the motherboard or remove more parts anyway. So I'm only gonna screw in all the screws when I know that everything is working. Let's have a look at our video card. So I chose this particular video card because it's only about a hundred bucks and it's gonna run all your games on high graphics at 1080p. It's got a mini display port connection at the very top there, HDMI and DVI. So it's got three different types of connection types. So regardless of what monitor you have, this should work quite well. The only downside is that it has a six pin connector. Usually video cards for around hundred bucks don't have six pin connectors. That's the connector that you're gonna use to power the video card. 
In other words, the video card needs extra power. Here's our storage, the PNY 120 gigabyte SSD drive. So this drive is very simple. In the United States, you can buy this drive in almost any store. Any big uh, box store like Walmart is gonna have them, Fred Meyer. Let's have a look at the solid state drive. So solid state drives are surprisingly light. They have two connectors. To install a video card for our particular case, we're gonna need a pry these doors open before we can install the video card. Now the thing is, if you don't do this, then you won't be able to put your video card in there because your input output ports are gonna to need to go through there and you just won't be able to. Some cases, you actually just unscrew a screw and then those just fly right off quite easily. But for my particular case, because it's a budget case, you literally just have to rip the, those little mini doors out before you can install the video card. So let's take a look at the video card and install it. You have these little notches right here and they're gonna go between the case and the motherboard. So let's go ahead and put them in. At the very bottom, you see the PCI Express Array pins area. You're gonna wanna stick it in there. All right, we're lining it up and we're making sure our input output ports are going in and we're also gonna be pushing towards that area a little bit simultaneously while we push down to insert the video card into the PCI Express slot. Push kind of firmly. Remember, you're gonna to wanna to apply a little bit of force to get it to work. There's also a latch that latches in as you're doing it. So here's our six pin connector. Because our power supply doesn't come with one, we're using an adapter that was provided to us with the video card. So with this six pin adapter, you just wanna install it into the video card. And then those Molex connections, the ones you see at the bottom there, plug those into a female version of the Molex connectors from the power supply. Let's go ahead and get our video card screwed in there. I try to make sure that I don't over tight the screws because over tightening the screws can risk damaging either the motherboard or the actual video card itself. So tighten the screws firmly, but don't tighten them too firm. Here we have our heatsink power connector. I'm gonna go ahead and connect that because without that connected, our CP won't be able to cool and our system just won't even run. You have to have that connected or else the CPU just won't be able to do anything. It'll just overheat and then shut itself off. So here are our Molex connectors. We're gonna go ahead and connect them. These connectors, provide a lot of resistance when you're connecting them the first couple times. So when you're plugging them in, just really try as hard as you can. But if they're still not going in, kind of like how you see here, remember you can move the little cords around and that's gonna move the male ends around. So sometimes you need to reposition them because they won't properly insert to the female end and you just have to kind of wiggle them around while you're doing it. All right, so now that we got that plugged in, we're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of cord management because without it, it's gonna get really, really messy. So we got, some, we got our little Velcro strap. We're gonna go ahead and wrap it around the cords. It's gonna provide better airflow. It'll provide better workflow management. So next time when I need to install other components, I'll be able to get in there much easier. I'll be able to see what's inside there easier. So I highly recommend you guys do this during the build process, any type of cord management work. You could even use tape if you really, really have to. I'm gonna go ahead and put our solid state drive right onto the Velcro. I've already attached some Velcro to the actual PNY drive itself to make it much easier to manage. I'm gonna show you how you can also screw in the PNY drive into the drive slot. For now, I'm just gonna get the power connected and I'm gonna put it on the Velcro strap. All right, so we're gonna plug it in. This little connector is called our SATA connector. Once we've got the power plugged in, we'll then need to connect our data connection. Let's get our four pin power connector plugged in into our motherboard. So the motherboard is gonna draw quite a bit of power and it's gonna redistribute it to all the other components inside your computer. You're definitely gonna to wanna to plug that in. Now let's do our 24 pin connector. That one's usually 
parallel with the RAM slot. So if you're having a hard time finding it, know that it's usually near the RAM. Go ahead and get it lined up. And it's in there. Gonna do a little bit more cord management to make sure everything's looking nice. All right, gonna wrap it around. Okay, it's looking pretty good. I made that particular one fairly thick because in the future when I need more cord management, I can just cut it off straight from that particular one there. All right, so here's what it looks like. The cords are fairly organized. I've seen better cord management, but for now this will have to do because it's just a good way to, to keep everything somewhat organized while we move forward. All right, now let's plug in our SATA connector for data transfer. So there's gonna be one connection on the drive itself and then one connection in the motherboard. Go ahead and get that connected now. All right, there it is. I try to keep it a little bit organized by plugging it into uh, the first one, but sometimes if you can't reach the first SATA connector, you can plug it into the third one or the other ones it shouldn't really matter too much, but when you start having more drives, it becomes confusing. So try to plug it in an order from either one or zero and then move up towards towards the other numbers as you add extra drives. Remember, you can always improve the cord management situation. Here, I'm going to take the SATA connector and I'm going to wrap it around the CPU heatsink to just make it a little bit more clean looking, a little bit more organized. Same thing with the heatsink uh, connector as well. All right, it's looking a lot nicer. Man, I'm really excited. This little $300 computer is gonna kick butt. I've already done testing on this one and you know it runs everything really, really well. And it, it, it really is like a PlayStation 4 killer. I mean, it runs all my games and it has Windows. What more could I ask for? All right, so this next part is one of the most annoying parts, simply because these little connectors are extremely annoying to connect because they're small. So let's do our HD audio connection. So when you look at the motherboard, there is these pins just kind of coming out and you're gonna to wanna to connect them to that. This one here is called the uh, F audio connection and it's missing a pin and you can line that up uh, while you're plugging it in. They're usually near the audio jacks so when you're looking for it on the motherboard it'll be near the audio jacks all right let's go ahead and get that plugged in and you really can only plug it into the correct one because they have special notches in there if you try to plug it in somewhere else it usually won't work let's get our front usb ports working all right so usually there's at least two to three different USB areas you can plug in, but in my particular case, there's really only just one more. Let's see, where is it at here? Okay, there it is. So it was it was actually perpendicular to my front audio. Let's get that plugged in there. All right, looking pretty good. All right, so now let's get our front panel connectors going. This is extremely hard to find, so look at your motherboard manual to see where you can find it. Also, here's where it's gonna get a little bit more tricky because these connectors are even smaller than the one from before. All right, so that one's usually gonna be near the RAM, near the 24 pin connector. Sometimes it varies where it's at, but usually it's near that area. So let's get our power switch connected first because that's the most important connection. Also keep in mind for the power switch, it doesn't matter which orientation you plug it in. Let's do that again real quick from a different angle. All right, so when you're trying to figure out which one it is, the motherboard manual will tell you which color to plug in or which specific area see how i've aligned it to look like it's on my motherboard it says pw minus pw plus power switch so i'm going to need to plug it into the pin that's missing now let's do our reset switch same thing so find the corresponding area and plug it in in my particular case it was right next to the power switch so reset switch and power switch makes sense that they're next to each other your motherboard might be exactly the same all right 
now that we've got those plugged in, we're pretty much good to go. You can plug in the hard drive LED and the power LED if you like, but those are really not necessary and they're kind of annoying. So keep in mind that you really don't have to plug them in if you don't want to. Let's do a little bit more cord management here and get this looking a little bit nicer. All right. What I do is I wrap the extra cords in and I tuck them away. That's really the best way to manage most cords. Tuck them around areas or places you can't really see them. All right, it's looking pretty good. Nice, simple $300 build. We'll run all your games, we'll play all your movies, and even do productivity. Pretty impressive stuff. If you wanna see what the home theater system is like, it's pretty awesome. I highly recommend you at least take a peek at it for at least a minute or so. It's extremely small in comparison to this tower build here. I even have one that's uh, the size of a power supply, even smaller. So two home media PC builds. Take a look at them, guys. Also, keep in mind, if you're looking for top performance, spinning around a thousand is how much you're gonna wanna spend. If you're looking to create a workstation system, skip to my workstation chapter and I'm gonna to explain to you what matters in a workstation computer. Generally, you wanna get a workstation if you have some kind of workstation related need. All right, so let's go ahead and do our AMD build for our Media Center PC that also can double as a gaming PC as well. Let's go over the parts that we have real quick. So we have the Antec case, the ISK case. We have the ITX motherboard. We have a storage drive, 120 gig, eight gigs of RAM, and we have a Zalman cooler. Now this cooler I picked specifically because the stock cooler won't work in this case. It's too big, it cuts out at about right here, and this will be protruding so I won't be able to close the door. So, and the other item that we have is gonna be the Insignia uh, thermal paste. We'll need this because our cooler does not come with thermal paste on it. If you look at the back, all it has is a little sticker. There is no thermal paste. Sometimes you can buy a cooler, it might come with thermal paste already on it, but this one did not. Most of the time they won't. You'll need to add thermal paste, unless you use a stock cooler, like the one that came with the AMD processor. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install the A10 CPU. Let's go ahead and put this CPU into our machine. So AMD machines are fundamentally different than Intel machines because of how many pins they have here on the back and how the pins actually come out. On an Intel system, there are no metal pins. These pins can be bent extremely easily, so be very careful during the installation process. Remember to also never touch the front part here because you don't want to have oils. Uh, if, you have oil, if, if your fingers are greasy, which they most likely are, and once you put the cooler on, it won't properly cool the CPU as much. So remember to not touch that with your hands. Let's go ahead and get this installed. So remember, there is this little triangle. You're gonna wanna line up the triangle with the one on the motherboard. So uh, for our particular one here, we're gonna need to lift up this latch, lift it up like that. And once the latch is lifted up, we can go ahead and install our CPU. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find the little triangle and there actually is a triangle and you can see it. It's on the top left, right over here. Let's go ahead and match the notch up with the triangle. And then also you can tell as well because if you look at the pin configuration, sometimes you can notice a pattern and you can line it up. But for our particular build, we're just gonna pay attention to that. All right, so let's go ahead and put this in. Remember, you're literally just kind of lightly just kind of setting it on there and you're just letting it fall in on its own. See how it snapped in? It fell in on its own. You can give it like a gentle wiggle or tug to verify that it's fully in there, but it is and the triangle did match the one on this black uh, rim right over here. So it's good. We're gonna go ahead and close it. We're gonna feel a decent amount of resistance while we're doing this. And then it just locks into place like that. And you're pretty much good to go. The only other consideration now is to, to install the cooler. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and install the RAM first. So let's zoom out here. So because this case is really small, it comes with quite a bit of wiring. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna wanna make sure that we can first get most of our components plugged in before we do this wiring here. 
Well, let's insert the RAM. So for RAM, it's really important to make sure that it's, to make sure that the notches line up. All right, so there's our RAM slot. Got our RAM. So if you try to plug in the RAM like this, it won't work. You'll need to flip the RAM over because of this notch right here. You see this notch? The notch doesn't line up with the notch right there. So we're just gonna flip the RAM around and we're gonna install it. There we go, flipped around. Now a really cool thing to think about is what's better, one stick of RAM or two sticks of RAM? You might hear the term dual channel. Sometimes people talk about this. Dual channel refers to having two sticks of RAM because two sticks of RAM will almost always be faster. And the way to understand this is two sticks of RAM is like having two pipelines. Also, don't forget to push these little notches up or else you won't be able to install it. Let's see here. Two sticks of RAM acts like having two pipelines connected to the CPU and the motherboard. That means the data can flow almost twice as fast. Now you won't always see a big difference with dual channel RAM, but having two sticks, if you can buy you know, two sticks of four gig instead of one stick eight gig, you should do that by all means because it'll almost always be faster in most instances. So once you snap one end in, you wanna snap in the other. All right, you got one end in, now we're gonna do the other. All right, it's in there. Okay, so now that we have those two parts in, we're gonna go ahead and install our heatsink. Be sure to remove this protective cover here and remember, don't touch it because oils on here are gonna ruin the connectivity. The reason we have the thermal paste is so we can properly connect the heat transfer from the CPU to the cooler and so the cooler's fan will spin, the air will flow through the metal prongs and then it'll cool the device. I actually did come in contact with this front part with my finger a few times. It's not the biggest deal, but I'm gonna go ahead and wipe it down with some alcohol before I apply this because I wanna make sure there's no grease whatsoever because I want the maximum cooling effect. Since this is a CPU that has a GPU built right in, it's a big deal. The temps will matter. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure everything's properly cooled. All right, so here I have a microfiber cloth and some 70% alcohol. I'm just gonna dab this in here real quick and then I'm gonna rub the CPU down. Make sure it's dry and it's gonna really clean it up and make it ready. So there's some, there's some things you have to worry about when installing it. Um, there are these two notches right over here, one here and one there. And this is really how AMD heat sinks differ from the Intel ones. On the Intel ones, they just have four holes. You push each uh, prong in and then it secures. But on the AMD ones, you have these little latches here. You have one latch here, one latch there. And one of the latches will usually have like a thumb, uh, like a thumb pressurized latch where you, you will push down and then it'll just uh, latch it in place. We wanna make sure we latch at least one of these first and then we latch the other one. Usually the one with the little pusher down device here, you'll latch at the end because you're gonna feel a lot of resistance while doing it. So I'm gonna latch it to that one there. Okay. 
botched in place. Oh crap. So you're gonna wanna be careful with these extra cords here. They're really gonna be an annoyance. Make sure you push them off to the side. All right, this is my favorite part. Just kidding, I hate this part. This can be really annoying. So once you've latched one end, it'll look kind of like that. And then you're gonna wanna latch the other end. But the other end is gonna have quite a bit of space. So you're really gonna have to push down very hard. See how it's kind of far away? Uh, you can't really see, yeah, there it is. See how far away that is? So you're gonna put, you can push down with a screwdriver sometimes with this or just use your fingers. I'm gonna use my fingers because it's safer. With a screwdriver, you can dislodge it from this area or if you put it in between this little prong right here, um, it'll actually push down pretty good. Unfortunately, I don't have a flathead Phillips screwdriver, but that's what you'd use. I borrowed one of my friends I had to give it back. So I'm just gonna use my hand for this one. Okay. Only other thing to worry about is sometimes certain coolers can clip the ram. Um, in this case, I don't think it'll clip the ram, but I'm not sure yet, I haven't tried it. I'm gonna go ahead and push down on this. And, oh man, it's really slippery. All right, I think I got it. Yeah, I got it, perfect. It's on there. And it's actually not even clipping the ram that much. Let's take a look. So here's kind of what it looks like with the cooler on there. So the cooler does stick up a little bit, but it's kind of no big deal because the door that I'm gonna put on it already has a little recessed space. So I'll be able to apply it just fine. All right, so a lot of these important connectors are wrapped. So we're just gonna unwrap them. If you wanna understand how to connect these particular connectors, like the USB, um, the audio, the HD audio, and the power switch and power reset and HDD, um, skip to the uh, portion of the video that has this done on the bigger motherboard. It's much easier to see on the bigger motherboard than on the smaller ones. Um, so just go ahead and skip to that and then you'll know how to do it. Same thing with installing the motherboard. To install this motherboard onto this system is the same thing. You find the screw holes, you line them up and then you just screw them in with whichever device you want to use. And then yeah, you're just good to go after that. So on the smaller case, to install the hard drives, you're gonna to need to actually remove the back panel here to do so. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that. I already removed the screws from the sides here to easily access it. And you're just gonna slide it in here. Kind of slides in like that. And then you'll wanna connect the power connector here and then the data transfer connector there. Is to just remove this bracket here before installing it so I'm just gonna go ahead and remove that. Then again, you don't have to put all the screws in. It really just depends. One screw will work, but there could be some rattling. So by putting a screw on the opposing side here, you will secure it pretty good. All right, and remember not to over tighten it because you could damage the drives or the components. One thing to think about is how on earth am I gonna connect the power plugs when there's such little space here? Well, I may have to feed the cords through a hole right over here before I install the motherboard or potentially after. So let's find the right connectors first. So we need to get the power connector, which is, I think I tucked it right over here. There it is. There it is. And remember there is a notch right here. We're just gonna line it up with a notch. You could connect it now, but I actually have to feed it through this hole here. the data connector as well. And for the data connector, we need a SATA cord. So the SATA connector looks very similar to the power plug. It's got two notches that you're gonna wanna line up. And feed the cord through the little slot here. And we're gonna interface it with the motherboard.
Usually the SATA data connections will be on the perimeter of the motherboard, perpendicular to the back input outputs panel. All right, and just go ahead and plug it in. Also, these SATA connections are numbered. Try to keep it organized by plugging it into the first number. Uh, if you plug it into like the fourth one, I think it sometimes takes longer to load, which is kind of the only downside. Right, and on this motherboard, I can't quite tell which one it is. Sometimes they're labeled, but sometimes they're very hard to tell. Okay, I do see there's an indicator here. Let me zoom in and show you what it looks like. Do you see where it says SATA 1 and SATA 2 and SATA 3, SATA 4? So it looks like number one is the furthest away one right here. Secure the the back plate. <clears throat> All right, let's start with some cord management. I'm gonna push this through here. I'm going to use some zip ties to tie up the cords. Also some Velcro straps, which are very useful. Let's take a look. Let's plug in the CPU fan. So usually the plug for that, you'll see two of them, and they'll have these little notches. Sometimes they look white, but just look for the ones that have the notches, and then you should be able to plug it in. There should be two right over here. Yep, I do see them. Let's get those plugged in. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this cord around the actual heatsink. That way there's no extra dangling cords. Alright, All right, looks like I'm not going to be able to. I think the, the heatsink's clipping it. Yeah, there we go. Got it. Perfect. Just enough room for it. in there. All right, let's plug in the HD audio. This is usually going to be next to the connectors that support the audio systems on the back here. It's right there. So I found the first USB plugs here, and it's gonna, there's a thing called the USB header, which is right over here. My particular case doesn't support the USB header, so we're gonna have to plug it into the older system right below it. They're usually right next to each other, and when you get close enough, it'll actually say USB on it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. See how it says USB right over there? It says USB one. I'm not sure why there's a J next to that. If anybody knows why, just let me know in the comments section below. It's in. So I've, just, I've discovered something pretty annoying about this particular case and the motherboard combination. So the case is old and it supports these older style plugs that don't go into the front right here. And because it only has one USB 2.0 connection below, I don't have it for the other one, which means some of these USB ports are not gonna be working. Probably the bottom ones or the top ones won't work. Um, however, because the system is small, it's not gonna really matter because I'm gonna have working USB ports on the back side. There's gonna be four of them, so either way, it's gonna be fine. It's just a little annoying thing that happens sometimes with cases. Um, they just sometimes don't work good with the motherboards or the motherboards don't work good with the case or vice versa. Just be prepared for that. The thing that I had the most problems with as a kid when learning how to build a PC are these uh, front panel connectors here. There's the power switch, the hard drive LED, and then there's a power LEDs as well. 
So the LEDs actually aren't as important. What they do is they just show that there that there is either hard drive activity going on or that the system is on. I always plug these in last because I really don't care about them as much. Plus the flashing lights at night could be kind of annoying. So let's do the power switch first. A cool thing to know about the power switch is it doesn't matter which way you plug it in. You can plug it in like this, or you can plug it in flipped over. Either way it'll work. In fact, if you have two conductive surfaces and everything is plugged, let's, let's just say your whole system's done, you can literally just touch the motherboard with a conductive surface like this in the area that has the power switch, just like that, touch it, and if you connect both, the whole system just turns on. So with this, it doesn't matter how you plug it in, it just connects both connections basically, and then links it up to the front button so when you push it, it'll actually start. Let's go ahead and get this plugged in. All right, so it looks like I can't locate the front panel header. That means I'm literally gonna have to look in the motherboard manual, because I can't see it anywhere here. I have no clue. I looked up, I looked at the top, the left and the right, bottom sides, so I just can't find it. It's very possible that the heatsink could be obstructing it, and I, I may even need to remove the heatsink to put this back on if I can't get my hands in there. It's so tight. Uh, hopefully it's not gonna come to that. All right, so here's the uh, booklet. We're looking for the front panel header. Okay, let's see here. I'm gonna have to look through the index. So we found the front panel for audio, but we need the, the headers. That's the part that's gonna allow us to turn the computer on. Full expansion connector, we've already got that connected. There it is. Now, I thought that this booklet would show us directly where it is on the motherboard. Unfortunately, it doesn't show that. So we're gonna have to try to find this type of connector that's missing a slot. And then we're gonna have to find the right uh, configuration with these header connectors. So let's just go ahead and do that now. This will be useful for when you're trying to find it. It says JFPI. So I'm gonna have to find the one that says that. P1 actually. All right, I actually found it. What do you know? I think this one here, yeah. So from the looks of this, I'm gonna to need to plug in the power switch right next to the pin that's missing. So let's do that. That concludes the wiring for this system. Now let's optimize the, um, the arrangement of the wires some more. So there is a small downside when closing the door is that it does clip the very bottom portion of the heat sink. And you could see it deforming the heat sink grills as you push down on it. That kind of isn't a big deal. As long as the fan can spin, the majority of the system is gonna be fairly cool. So we shouldn't have a problem. Screw in the antennas. Looks kind of like a router. Actually, it's about as big as a router. Now, the last thing you don't want to forget to plug in is the four pin power connector. We have it at the very bottom here, and I just tried to run the system and it, nothing was booting, and I actually forgot to plug the four pin power connector in. It kind of looks like the four pin PCI Express connector, except this one can only go into the motherboard slot. You also have the 20 pin at the very top there as well. It looks like that there. Once you've plugged those in all the way, the system should have enough power to boot. Uh, the downside with these plugs though is that they're extremely hard to plug into the motherboard. You have to push really, really hard. And my system wasn't booting because I had like a little crack, a visible crack in here where it wasn't pushed in all the way. So I had to push it in all the way to make it work. So don't forget about your 20 pin uh, connectors and then the extra four pin power connector as well. And once you get those in, your system should boot pretty good. So with proper cord management, you can really clean up the look of the PC. And now we really just have a, a, a whole lot less uh, clutter. We can actually access these back panels here and not really have a lot of trouble moving around. The only last optimization that I'm gonna do here is with the heatsink. So because the heatsink slightly clips 
the bottom of our uh, back plate here. As you can see, you put this back on here and then it clips that back part. I'm gonna use some pliers to bend it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bend it in a particular way where I'm gonna keep the same type of airflow uh, and the same distance. Uh, so they're equal distant, but they still cool properly. So I've completed the modification and the pins are now properly bent. Let's have another look. See how it pops up. There's still a little bit of pressure on them, but at least this way we can have it closed without too much flex. So there's what it looks like. So you can see that there's still spaces in between for the air to flow. Of course, it's definitely not a perfect job and it, can, it could be done better if you take more time to do it, but this should be enough to still cool the system properly uh, while also still being able to close the door on the system. <laughs> All right, so let's get our Intel system to work. So the nice thing about our Intel system is that when you buy it, it already includes the motherboard inside and it includes the CPU as well. And because this particular Core i5 is very similar to the AMD APU, it has a thing called the Iris 540 graphics on there. It can game, and it can game pretty darn good. On this little system, we can play games like Battlefield 4 or Grand Theft Auto and run at medium graphics at 1080p. So this is a really cool little system. The thing that really blows my mind about this system is that it's literally one fourth the size of the system I just built. So because of that, I mean, that's, that's something. So this is what we call a bare bone kit because it already includes a lot of the peripherals that we need. So essentially the only thing we're installing is gonna be the RAM stick and the hard drive. Now for this one, I opted for a, a solid state drive that was also a hard disk drive hybrid. So what it is, is it's called a SSHD. It's got a one terabyte drive in there and, and uh, 128 gigabytes of solid state storage. So when I'm installing Windows, I'm gonna put Windows on the solid state and install all my games on the hard drive disk. That way I have a lot of storage and still maintain pretty quick speeds. Only downside is load time for games might be a little bit slower. All right, so let's get this baby opened up. Take a look. All right, I've already unscrewed all the other screws, so we're good to go. Just pull up and the system opens up. Have a look inside. So inside we can see the slot for the RAM and the slot for the hard drive. All right, let's go ahead and install the RAM first. So the cool thing about this RAM is that it's, it's half the size of normal RAM. So for systems like this, it makes a lot of sense to maximize the space efficiency. Take a look at this notch here. Make sure the notch lines up with what you see on the motherboard. Because if you don't line up the notches, it's not gonna insert properly. You might even risk damaging some of the pins. So if I try to insert it like this, it won't work. I'm gonna need to flip it over like that. All right, let's go ahead and get this plugged in. So because it's laptop-based RAM, with laptop RAM, you actually insert it diagonally. You don't insert it from either the top or the side. Take a look. See how it's diagonal? Once you insert it that way, all you do is you just kind of push down and then you hear this really scary cracking sound, but then it actually, um, is stabilized and it's properly inserted. There are these little pins that make that sound. They're really archaic looking, but they actually work really well. All right, so the RAM's installed. Let's do the hard drive next. Small little thing. Okay, let's pop this in. Okay, so from the looks of it, let me actually look inside here, because I want to see where the power connectors are. 
There they are. All right, so we've got the power connector and the data connector. Data connector's on the right side. So I'm gonna to need to make sure that I line it up with that. So I'm gonna do it like this. So it's gonna be upside down then. And just kinda of plop it in there. So the motherboard you see here, this is a full-size motherboard. The one that I opted to go with was an ITX motherboard. The reason for this was because I wanted to minimize my hardware components so I could put them later in smaller systems like the ones you see here. That there is an ITX uh, form factor and then right next to it is the same thing. Here you can see both a full-size motherboard and an ITX board side by side. As you can see, there's a pretty big difference between the two. I always opt for ITX now because I feel like they're just cheaper and they're just more affordable and they're better for smaller builds. But if you want to get the most out of your system, building a system with a full board is better because in most cases you're going to get, you're going to get a lot more RAM slots. You're going to get two video card slots so you can put two video cards. This means that you're going to have much, much better performance. So if you're looking for the best performance, opt for a full size board. But if you're looking to make a smaller system and you also want to have a cheaper system, getting an ITX board makes a lot of sense because they're a lot smaller and more affordable. And buying a case, sometimes the power supply is included in the case, but most of the time it will not be included. So you'll have to buy yourself a power supply. Power supply is just, it's going to power all of your components. And if you have a lot of money, you can opt for one that's modular. Modular power supplies are much better for cord management because you can unplug the cord right here and plug in what you need and don't have plugged in what you don't need. If you look at something like the smaller ITX build here, the power supply will actually be something more along the lines of an external one. We have an external power supply here with a little power plug and it's the same type of system you have with this Intel Nook. They use external power supplies a lot like a laptop does. When building a computer, the fastest and cheapest type of storage you can get is a PNY 128GB uh, hard drive. Now, the reason why these hard drives are good is because they're solid state, which means they have no moving parts and they work a lot like RAM chips, uh, except they're just a lot slower, but they're still much, much faster than hard drive disks. If you look over here, we have a hybrid of the two. It's called a solid state hard drive disk. It uses an internal solid state drive with a hard drive disk to give you a lot more storage. As you can see here, this is one terabyte, so that's 1000 gigabytes, as opposed to something like this, which is only 120 gigabytes. It's literally one tenth the capacity. However, keep in mind, if it's a full SSD, it'll still be about four to 10 times faster. So when constructing my ITX build, I chose to get a different CPU cooler. I did this because the clearance of the two CPU coolers really does matter. If you look here, you see that the cooler on the right is not as tall and it allows for the installation inside this case here. If I was to use this one, the red portion of the CPU heatsink would overhang and I would not be able to close the door on the front of it. When building ultra small form factor gaming rigs or media center PCs, you want to consider how big it's going to be. One of the smallest that I've seen is this one here. It's smaller than a standard power supply that you'd find in like, in like the computer that we built earlier, but it also uses much smaller components. So when you're picking out RAM for, some, for a system like this, the RAM itself will actually be a lot smaller. This is going to be more like laptop RAM. You compare it to standard size RAM, there is a pretty big difference. It's about half of the normal size. For this particular media center rig that I built, I decided that I would go with the laptop SSHD because I wanted to store about a terabyte of games, but I also wanted to store movies. If I would have just opted for a 128 gigabyte SSD, then I would not have nearly enough space. But considering that most things are now streaming based, you really don't have to have a 
pretty big storage drive. You can just rely on 120 gigs. One of the really cool options about going with a smaller gaming PC or a media center PC is that they're just extremely portable. Something like this right here would be the middle ground. Still very portable, comes with a power supply. But I also decided that I wanted to build an APU gaming rig like the one you're seeing here because I could literally pick it up with one hand. It would be about the size of a PlayStation Pro or PlayStation Slim, but even smaller. Take a look at the comparison there. It's almost the same size, but even smaller. When you compare the thicknesses, it's literally the same type of thickness, but it's still a little bit more portable. Very impressive. When you compare it to the Intel Nook, it's actually one fourth the size of the AMD APU that we're building. Pretty crazy that it's one fourth the size. Seeing as this is already so much smaller, this Intel Nook is even smaller with similar performance. If you're trying to install a CD-ROM drive, it's gonna go at the top right here. You just slide it in, then take the screw and screw it basically in, and it's very, very simple. So what you see here that I did with my PNY drive, how it's uh, attached via Velcro, well, the thing is, you don't have to do it this way. I did it because I think it's easier. If you really want, you can just leave your SSD dangling or you can just uh, put your SSD in and you line up the screw hole and then you just screw it in. It's very, very simple. And then it's just kind of hovering. You really just need only one screw. Some people will tell you that you need to do you know, two screws or all of the screws. It's really personal preference. If you do more than one screw, it's a lot more secure. But I like it this way because then I can easily access it anytime I need. And I feel like it's just much easier this way. So depending on how you wanna do it, feel free to use any option that works for you. We're gonna look at the components that it takes to make a PC. We're gonna talk about each component and strictly what it does and not necessarily how to install it. If you wanna look at that particular section, just follow the index and take a look at how to assemble the computer. So at the core of the computer, you have basically just a motherboard. The motherboard is gonna connect all the peripherals and all of your microchips and all your stuff together. It's essentially the main connection point for all of your hardware. Here you have your CPU. This kind of acts as like the brain of the computer. It does all the arithmetic and crunching of the numbers. It's very similar to the brain, but uh, it doesn't do any storage, which our brain does CPU and storage at the same time, so this is kind of different. Here we have a heat sink. This item here is designed to basically cool the CPU as it's doing work because lots of electricity throws to, flows through it and essentially it just gets, just gets extremely hot while it's working. The RAM is the temporary storage facility for when you access data. So you have a hard drive or an SSD drive and then you also have RAM. Information goes from the storage or the hard drive to the RAM as a temporary point when you're working with it. Think of it as a room that you can work in. Uh, when you load information, it's just stored there, and then when you shut your computer off, the information from the RAM is purged. Next up, we have our video card. The video card is just like a CPU, except it's mostly designed for crunching the data for video-related tasks. However, a video card can be optimized to do other things. It's mostly optimized for video. This particular card here, it's the RX 460 and it's designed for gaming. It's got four gigabytes of, of video RAM. So a uh, video card also has RAM, just like the RAM you'd put in your motherboard, but it's specifically designed for video. On the back of it, we have some uh, IO ports, inputs and outputs. And here you can see we also have a heatsink on it as well. Let's take a look at what our storage drive looks like. So here's an SSD storage drive. On this drive here, you're gonna store most of your files like Windows. You always wanna store your most important files on your actual hard drive, like Windows for instance, so it loads fairly quick. We can also try connecting external hard drives if you need more storage or other drives that can also act as like places to store your video games, your photos, your work files, that kind of thing. But always try to get a separate drive where you can store your operating system to make things a lot snappier. And a good example of this would be waiting, waiting for a computer to boot up. It could take anywhere two to three minutes, sometimes five minutes on some older computers. Instead, with an SSD drive, it'll take anywhere from 20 to 25 seconds to boot, so it's substantially faster. Once you insert your CPU and RAM, here's what it'll look like. When building a computer, you want to define what your budget will be. You can either build a computer for $1,000, $500, or $300. The most important part will be the CPUs 
and the GPU as well as the storage. Those three things are the most important things when it comes to building a computer. Depending on which type of configuration you do, it'll determine the speed of your overall computer and how well it gets things done. Right now we're looking at the Core i7 Unlocked 7700K processor. This is gonna run you about 300 bucks. This is what you wanna get if you're an enthusiast level person who wants the most performance out of their computer. Here's a Pentium processor. This one here is about 50 bucks. This is what most people should be buying if they just wanna play games or do basic productivity. Here is an AMD APU processor. This processor is quite different. It incorporates two separate things. It has a CPU and a GPU in one. Essentially, if you get this, you won't need a video card. However, it won't perform as good as having a video card separately and a CPU separately, but it does save on costs because then you won't need to buy a video card and other components. An enthusiast level video card would be something like a GTX 10 80 or GTX 1070. Even a GTX 1060 is considered pretty, pretty good. Here we have an AMD version, the RX 460. It's about hundred bucks, fairly cheap. Four different types of storage drives you can get. You can get an M2 storage drive, which can be extremely fast, or you can get a SATA drive, which would be pretty good. This is what most people should be buying. We're running about hundred bucks. The M2 drive that we saw earlier is gonna run you a couple hundred bucks. And then this PNY one here will run you about 50. Same thing for, for this uh, laptop SSHD. It's gonna run you about 50 bucks. But the benefit of the laptop SSHD is that they have a lot more storage. All right, so let's talk about workstation PCs and why they matter. So a workstation PC generally is gonna have pretty powerful components and it's gonna be able to do work a lot faster, like significantly faster. And on average, they're supposed to be a lot more stable. So here you see my workstation PC that I built. Again, I use the ITX form factor because I like the ability to have a lot of space to work in here without being too cluttered. Um, and it's just, I really like the idea of being able to put my workstation into a smaller uh, computer size case if I really need to. When you look around, you see that I have a lot of useful things like this Samsung SSD drive. I put all my work on here so I can be mobile. Um, it's uh, 512 gig and it's just, it's really fast and portable. I have a 128 gigabyte SD card where I uh, take my footage from my camera with my nice Sigma lens and then I take my work from the audio recording that I do with my Zoom H6 and then I put it all into my computer here so then I can do work on my widescreen monitor. Now the reason this is workstation is because these parts that I have, everything I have here is optimized uh, to get work done and that's really important for me. So the reason I like this widescreen monitor is because when I open up my timeline, when I look at my workflow, I can see this timeline here where I see all the chunks for the video that I'm making uh, and it, everything's wider so I can see more. So it's really important for you know workflow analysis to be able to see all the work that I'm doing and I really, really like that. But let's talk about more about the individual parts that go into making this workstation machine. So I have a substantially bigger cooler by Thermaltake. I have uh, 16 gigabytes RAM. Most of the time you won't need more than 16 gigabytes RAM when you're making a workstation machine, but uh, 16 gigabytes RAM is kind of the sweet spot. You can go for 32 if you really want. If you make really big projects, 32 can actually make a difference. Um, I have this GTX 1080. Uh, it's really, really powerful card. You can get the Titan if you really need to, but the thing with the Titan is the Titan costs twice as much, but you only get around 30 to 40% more performance. So for me, it just wasn't really worth it. I am a big gamer, so I do want to have really good graphics. So before this, I did a lot of my work on the Mac Pro, and to be frank, I loved the thing. The Mac Pro was about the size of this power supply, just a little bit taller, and it, you know, it had a great processor, it had pretty decent GPUs. Unfortunately, it's considered somewhat old, but because of the hardware configuration, it was extremely stable. Now, I switched to this custom-built PC because I was starting to use a lot of Windows-related apps. I have the Adobe Suite, and I also like the idea to be able to game on the same operating system instead of having to switch you know, to Mac all the time. So the reason why I chose this case is because I like how there's fans here. There's two fans uh, over there. Right now they're off because they're clogged and I need to fix them. 
this is kind of an old case I got from a friend. It used to be one of my old cases, but I built him a computer rig and then he didn't want it, so he gave it back to me. But uh, basically this system is optimized for work. I have my dongle where I can plug in multiple USB drives uh, and multiple things that use USB. I have my headset that I use for work. This is just, you know, a basic gamer headset, G35. It costs about anywhere from 80 bucks to 100 bucks. Actually a gift from one of my friends, pretty awesome. Um, this headset, you know, it isn't the best for work, but because it's a decent gamer headset and, it, and it's decent, it's very comfortable and the reliability is good. This headset won't break if you drop it or if you mistreat it. And it has a uh, scroller right here, which I thought is really, really neat. So I use the scroller and it's just, it's all kind of built in there. They have some extra buttons you can utilize, which is quite nice. So the processor that I went with is the uh, 7700K processor. And the reason I chose this processor for a workstation is because simply the single threaded performance is extremely good. It's really, really good. When I launch apps that aren't optimized for multi-core, it's so fast. It's screaming fast how quickly they load. And part of the reason why they load quick is because the new uh, Cabby Lake architecture is really fast. The CPU runs at like 4.2 uh, gigahertz and it can be overclocked to 5 gigahertz. I haven't even bothered with that quite yet. And it takes advantage of extremely fast hard drives. Because it's fast, it can interface with fast hard drives and it can also take advantage of the fast RAM, which is you know, 2100 megahertz. For my bulk of my storage, I have the 850 EVO, right? And it's 500 gigabyte and it's relatively fast. When we open up Device Manager and I take a look at my storage controller, you see here that it says Samsung NVMe. The reason why Samsung drives that uh, support NVMe are really, really important is because they are just ridiculously fast. You know, the fact that I can close uh, Premiere Pro, I mean, this is, a, this is a lot of clips here and I can scan through them with ease, like super duper fast. You cannot do this on a $300 computer very easily. You can't really do this with a $500 computer because you don't have a lot of storage, so you can't store all these clips. And when you scan on, you know, those like a $500 gaming computer, this will be choppy. It won't be as good. Part of what makes this system really good is that there's a lot of high quality components. 7700K CPU is great. Takes advantage of the 850 EVO. It really takes advantage of this 960 EVO M2. This thing has about 3.2 gigabytes read. So you can open up a file that's 3.2 gigabytes in one second. That is extremely important for my line of work. And to interconnect all this, I have just a uh, 600 watt thermal take power supply. Right now, this power supply, I just kind of got it to complete this build. I actually have a modular power supply that I think you guys should take a look at instead. It's actually a lot better. This one's not modular, so you have a lot of extra cords dangling, and it's not very organized. I really don't like the fact that it's not organized. I want my machine to actually look nice and also be organized, but unfortunately, I didn't quite do that for this particular build. Here's what a modular power supply would look like. You could simply unplug what you don't need and plug in what you do need. And this is the way to go. This is the way to go if you have more money and can afford much better quality components. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about is whether you should go with a Xeon processor or not. So this workstation rig I have here doubles as a gaming rig, but it also works very well as a workstation. The other thing I could have done with this build that I recommend that you guys actually do is make it a Xeon build. Now, the thing about Xeons is that they're not the greatest for gaming, but they do an excellent job with stability. These processors are also designed to work at full load and essentially they don't break down. They don't break down as quickly as something that you would find in like an Intel i7 or i5 or i3. They maintain their integrity. They can stay hotter for longer. They also support a lot more cores. The reason to go with Xeon is that because they have more cores, they support more memory bandwidth and they just can do a lot more threads. So for instance, let's say you're doing video editing, you're doing uh, 3D rendering and modeling, just working with a lot of power and you need power basically, right? Well, Xeons will give you the most performance for your money um, if you have a lot of it because they can support up to 12 cores 
Some experimental processors can support 22 cores. And when you have that, when you pair that with hyper threading, you know, you're getting, you know, like 40 threads uh, or 20 threads, depending on which one you get. And that is a lot of threads. That means you can compile a video or compile a 3D project in quite literally, you know, one tenth of the, of the time you would normally waste you know, running on like an i5 processor or like a basic i7 processor that, that, that may not be like, for instance, like a 7700K. Maybe you buy an older i7 2600K, you know, something along those lines. And Xeon is just extremely stable. Now, the other thing that Xeon support is a thing called ECC memory. So why is ECC memory important? Well, with ECC memory, it has a special module in there that that basically adds up all the bits and it can detect an error and just basically remove it and then you just don't have the error that happens. So ECC stands for Error Correcting Code Memory. So essentially it prevents crashes, it prevents freezing. It's just so much more stable. When you have a lot of money on the line and you're doing a lot of work, ECC memory is definitely the way to go and uh, pair that with a Xeon because I think they pretty much have to work together. The reason I went with my build is because I'm a gamer and I do want a game, but I also want to have workstation-like performance. So a lot of you started watching this video because you wanted to know what it's like to build a computer. And I've showed you a lot of different builds, you know, from ranging from small to big. I've shown you what it's like to make a gaming computer, media center computer, what it takes to make a workstation computer. And um, I want you to consider getting a Mac if you have workstation related needs. Uh, now, Macs are fairly expensive. The thing is you can always build yourself a better computer, but what you can't really build uh, into your computer is the same type of reliability that you get from a Mac. Macs have this thing that's this it's unparalleled. Let's say for instance, you have at least $1,000 to spend, or let's say you have $2,000 to spend, you get yourself an iMac. It's an all-in-one system. It's clean. There's not as many cords. It's not as annoying as like, you know, a system like this with all these cords and all this troublesome stuff going on. It's an all-in-one system. And when you're working on a project, it's really, really nice to have that because it declutters your mind and allows you to focus on your work. Of course, don't get a Mac for gaming. They do game and I have tested that out quite a bit in my channel. So I, I'm telling you, you should just check my channel out if you are interested in gaming uh, with a Mac Pro. But all in all, the reason you would get, for instance, like, like a Mac Pro is because it does have those Xeon related chips. It does support that ECC memory. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful, breathtaking machine that works really well. However, if you are looking for the best value, you really just, you can't compare what a custom built PC can do for you. It's highly versatile. It'll cost you one third the price, if not one fourth the price, depending on where you get your uh, components. It's just really good for getting work done. But for gaming, I definitely opt to build a system. Now, because I have both a PC and a Mac background, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this Mac keyboard. I really love this Mac keyboard. And one of the reasons why I like Macs, because I just like what they stand for. This particular Mac keyboard, it's thin. It works really well and has this all metal build, which just feels phenomenal. When you're holding the keyboard, it's extremely light and everything about this keyboard makes sense. It has a little module for a connection point for charging and it has these keys that feel kind of mechanical, but also kind of like a uh, laptop keyboard. And to be frank, the future of keys is basically either no keys or we'll be typing on like a screen of some sort. And we already have this tested with our phones. We already do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, having a lot of key travel isn't necessarily important. It is for some people, it, it can be for gamers, but the majority of what's happening at keyboards is they are moving away from that kind of design. So me personally, I'm a big fan of Apple computers, but I also love the idea of building your own computer and having that control that you can't normally get. I wanted to talk to you guys about barebone kits because I have seen some pretty good deals. Uh, essentially, barebone kits are like comboed deals where you get discounts. For instance, if you buy a motherboard, it can come with a CPU and RAM, and they can give you a discount of like $50. So part of the reason why barebone kits can be good is because 
you can just find a really good deal. However, myself personally, because of how specific my system usually ends up being, bare bone kits tend to not be as good for me because I can't find a discount because the products that they're bundling are just products that I don't really need. But if you look around, you can sometimes find good deals. The other types of bare bone kits that you can find is systems that are almost fully built, but that don't have either an operating system installed, or they need a hard drive, or they need like a few extra parts to get them working. For instance, here we're looking at uh, Intel Nooks or Intel NUC uh, mini computers. Well, I did talk about the one that I have here, and this one here, you know, when I bought it, it didn't have RAM and it didn't have a hard drive. So I had to add those components so I could make it work. And I love this thing. I think it's totally worth it. So if you're looking at bare bone kits and you want like a little mini computer that you can put in your hand, uh, the Intel Nooks are definitely a great option. So my best advice to you is first assemble your system, then see if any bare bone kits exist that'll let you uh, basically acquire some savings and if you can't find any savings with the bare bone kit then don't go with the idea of getting a bare bone kit because you might end up compromising performance which would not be a good thing because they may end up bundling a processor or RAM that you don't want or don't need or it's just slower before we can install Windows we'll need to get a USB flash drive to complete the process so let's go to the Microsoft website and see if we can grab an ISO from their website. So type in Windows 10 ISO download. Then also open up another tab and type in Windows 10 OEM key. I'll also have a link in the description with a special website where you can buy the key from. They'll be selling the key I think for around 15 bucks. So if you guys want to use that link and give me a little bit of commission, uh, go ahead and use that link and uh, it'll help the channel out greatly. The link will take you to a site called SCD keys where you can uh, get a CD key for Windows 10 Home Edition or Windows 10 Pro. I have the Pro Edition link, it's only a dollar more, it has a lot more features, so you'll want to use that particular one. Once you have the key, you're going to want to go back to the Windows, to the Microsoft website, and click on their Download Tool Now section, and it'll show you how to create an installation using media, USB flash drive, DV, or ISO file. You want to click on that, and it'll show you some instructions on how you can take that uh, take the ISO that they're going to help you download and then put it onto your USB flash drive. So the file is called an ISO because it's an image of a disk. And we're putting this image onto the USB flash drive. Just follow the instructions on how to do that. Here, let's go ahead and get this thing installed. Power your computer on and make sure that it boots from the USB flash drive. You can do this by either pressing delete or the F12 key and then selecting boot from USB drive. Once it boots, you're just gonna to wanna to click next and just keep clicking next to all the panels you're gonna basically just install Windows 10. And once it's installed, it may restart once or twice, but after that, it'll boot up and it's gonna ask you what kind of features you want enabled. You can disable most of the features you don't need because uh, most of them are just to track you and a few of them are just features that just aren't very useful. Once you're in Windows, you're gonna wanna make sure that your little computer has drivers. So if you have a computer with a CD-ROM drive, you can use the disk drivers that came with your device, or you can go ahead and uh, click on the start button and, and go into the search, type in device manager, then go into other devices and right click on any of the uh, devices that show an exclamation or a question mark and click update driver software. But before you can do that, make sure your device is plugged in with ethernet. This will allow you to just basically grab the drivers you need through the internet. Now, the reason the drivers are important is because they're pieces of software that tell your hardware how to communicate with each other. Without that, the hardware itself can't really do anything. So here I'm getting the wireless ethernet driver, I'm getting the graphics driver, and essentially you can just keep doing this process and after you're done you should have wi-fi once that's set up you're going to want to go to nightnight.com and then from here you're going to select a bunch of very useful tools like chrome classic start classic start brings back the classical start menu right now the start menu is really confusing it doesn't seem to work right uh, definitely going to want classic start 
also like to win RAR, Skype, VLC for watching movies. Fubar 2000 is pretty good, some people really like it. Grab CCP Codec Pack, that's going to allow you to open up a lot of different movie files. Get Shockwave Air, Silverlight, Net, and, and Java. Those are runtimes, they allow you to run certain programs, and they're going to make your browsing experience better. I also selected Cubit Torrent for my torrenting needs, Steam, and then the Google Drive. And the cool thing about this program is that it bundles all of those programs into one download. So that one download will download and, inst and install all of those programs. So you won't need to open up and install all those programs separately. Installing them and downloading them separately and clicking next to all the end user license agreements could take quite some time. So going this route, you're actually gonna save quite a bit of time. So definitely use Nine for your needs after you've installed your operating system. Hey guys, what's up? It's your boy Serge. So I wanted to talk to you guys about Patreon. This is an amazing platform that allows you to donate to creators that you really like and want to support. So the point of this is to essentially support creators and to give them the funds they need so they can continue to reinvest into YouTube and build a much better channel. So right now I'm spending most of my time at my day job and it's something that you know I do it because I need it because I do need the money and I try to do a good job there but my actual dream is to be the youtuber to do a really good job on YouTube and to do that I'm gonna need to increase the video quality I'm gonna need to make better sound better video content I need to spend more time and I can't really do that unless I have a day job now the thing is if I can get a certain amount of you guys to donate I've done some calculations about three to five percent of you if you guys can donate and pledge support of one or two dollars or more we can I can seriously quit my job overnight uh, now the reason for this is because there's about 10,000 of you so not a lot of you have to donate but the thing is it does go a long way because I've already spent thousands and thousands of dollars and countless hours on developing the channel idea you know creating the thumbnails creating the video and replying to your guys' comments because I do spend about an hour to two hours every day replying to your guys' comments alone. So I really hope you do consider this as an opportunity to help develop the channel. Any of you who are donating to the channel, pledging support, I will have direct contact with you guys. So that'll take priority over normal questions on YouTube. I'll always answer your guys' questions first. So that to me is really exciting because that shows that you're a super fan, that you really do care. Um, I'm also going to be allowing you guys to really have your hand in the development of the channel itself. So are you looking for me to expand the channel? Do you want me to create more you know, HP videos as opposed to Alienware videos? What kind of videos do you want me to create? You know, I'm going to stay in complete contact with you guys. So uh, thank you for watching guys and I hope I, can, I could convince you to pledge your support. I'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers.